Hi, I'm Raj Kumar, President and Editor-in-Chief at DevX. You're listening to Davos Dispatch, our special edition of This Week in Global Development. I'm here in the freezing cold, snowy ski town in Switzerland for the World Economic Forum's annual meeting. And I'm here to pull back the curtain for all of you who listen to this podcast through conversations with a number of diverse leaders from around the world on some of the most important issues facing the globe today. Listen in and let me know what you think. It's no surprise that climate change came up in nearly every conversation I had in Davos. In this episode, you're gonna hear from three leaders focused on separate challenges, affordable housing, defeating infectious diseases, ending modern slavery. But interestingly, all of those conversations ended up touching on the climate crisis and how it intersects with their work. For example, There was talk at this year's World Economic Forum meetings about preparing for the so-called disease X, a disease that we don't know about yet, but that may be coming over the horizon. But Peter Sands, the executive director of the Global Fund, who you'll hear from later in this episode, has said, quote, the next health crisis could actually be the impact of climate change fueling existing diseases as opposed to some new disease X. We're going to start with Jonathan Reckford, the CEO of Habitat for Humanity, who says climate is one of the key forces exacerbating the problem of affordable housing globally, a problem you likely are seeing where you live almost no matter where you're listening to this episode. It's uh, always a pleasure to run into you here in the uh, snowy mountains of Davos, and uh, you're always getting me smart on issues around housing, because obviously Habitat does you know, a lot of work across housing affordability, housing policy, and we're in this strange circumstance in the world, I hope you can explain it to me, where it seems like the housing crisis is truly global. Now, you think of this as, well, maybe in certain countries, you know, affordability's gotten out of control, but it's really the entire planet, right? Sadly, yes. You know, the contexts are very different, but we're seeing uh, remarkable challenges. And there's no question the trends have been there for a long time. Uh, The pandemic exacerbated it. And then clearly a combination of uh, war in Europe and now in the Middle East uh, and then climate are exacerbating further. So what we have is really a a huge supply problem and a massive affordability challenge. And this is all happening at the same time that people are moving into cities all around the world at an at a rapid pace right is it what do you what do you see when you look at the trends around urbanization well the biggest demographic trend in the last 50 years is rapid urbanization so we are now an urbanized world for the first time in human history and there's no sign of that changing so you can't stop people from moving to cities but our cities don't have the infrastructure or housing for their current populations let alone uh, their projected populations. And then they, again, that's exacerbated by both war and climate. So that's pushing more people. Uh, we have the greatest migration since World War II, uh, since, uh, since the breakout of the, Uc- the European War. And what's happened then is we have almost a billion people now living informally uh, in cities. And that number is projected to double over the next 20 years if we don't do something about it. So, so informally, we're talking about informal settlements. A lot of people call them slums, right? Places where people essentially have squatted, but now it's over many generations that they've been there. And some of these informal settlements are as big as cities themselves. Absolutely. So, you know, I think about, um, you know, I spent time in Swacha outside Bogota, Colombia, These are families who fled the narco wars 30 years ago, 25 years ago. So they've been living in these hillside communities for 25 years, but without the legal right to stay. And so therefore they live in terrible conditions and actually pay relatively high rents uh, because of that. Now what we've seen is there's a huge economic multiplier if we then formalize some of those communities. So there are places that doesn't make sense, but in this case, uh, two really smart steps from the Colombian government, which is one, Uh, formalize, give the families the right to stay, and simplify the process of actually getting secure tenure title. Because when a family knows they can stay, then it's rational to actually invest in upgrading their housing. 
The other thing is you start to see a market development. So now you could actually sell your house. So you've actually got a financial asset. The other thing they did is they actually started building transportation. So bus rapid transit out to the community and cable cars up into the hillside. So instead of it being a three hour trek into downtown Bogota, it's a 30 minute uh, trip. That opens up economic value as well. So what we've seen is there's huge untapped economic power in these informal settlements. We actually launched a study that showed uh, a dramatic increase in up to 10% increase in GDP nationally for countries that invest in, in upgrading the housing in these informal settlements because it actually lowers health costs, uh, increases the financial incomes of those families, creates jobs, uh, and creates a huge multiplier as these families then become stable and start investing. It's amazing how much this is an issue that impacts sort of everything else, right? Uh, you know, if you think about livelihoods, if you think about education and health, it's all pretty connected to where you live. Deeply so. So. Um, if you really, you know, we would never say housing is the only thing, but in many ways it really is a prerequisite. And so what we know uh, in country after country, global north or global south, is if a child grows up in, in stable housing, she stays healthier, therefore she has a chance to do well in school, therefore has that chance to, to grow into all that God intends. If you pull housing out, you see poor health outcomes, then you see poor educational outcomes, then you see people stuck in that cycle of poverty. And, and it, you need all of it. So it's not that housing instead of, but we often believe that housing has been underprioritized. And, you know, one of my hypotheses is that for most of us who grew up in good housing, uh, it's not visceral. We all can relate to health and education. But I think for those who've never experienced the absence of housing or lived uh, paying 60 percent of our income on our rent uh, and therefore having to make horrific choices about what else you can afford or not be able to afford, I think it's hard to relate. Now that middle-class families' children are struggling to pay for housing, I think housing suddenly is on the agenda in a different way. Hi, I'm Kate Warren, Executive Editor at DevEx. If you are listening to this podcast, you are likely working to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. But are you subscribed to DevEx Newswire? Global development can be a fast-moving, complex sector. Our team of global reporters work every day to bring you the news you need to make sense of it all. In DevX Newswire, we keep you up to date on issues ranging from climate change financing to gender equality and global health to transforming the food system, all in a fun-to-read, free newsletter delivered directly to you five days a week. Join the hundreds of thousands of global development professionals who receive DevX Newswire and visit devx.com slash newsletters to sign up to this free newsletter today. We often talk about how the climate emergency will hit people who live in places that had the least to do with causing it, the hardest. And the impact of climate change could leave these communities more vulnerable to forms of modern slavery, including human trafficking, forced labor, and child slavery. That connection may not seem obvious, but you'll learn more about it in my conversation with Sophie Atiende, the CEO of the Global Fund to End Modern Slavery. She is well aware of these challenges as she works to end what she calls a crime of economic opportunity that exists in every country. You're an activist, you're an expert on the topic, you're a survivor yourself. So I just am so honored to get a little bit of time with you to just learn a bit more about what you're doing and kind of get your high level thoughts. So maybe we just start with what you're what you're here telling people and talking to people about at the annual meetings of the World Economic Forum. I, I'm, I'm happy I'm here because we fundamentally have built an economy that is based on inequality, one, and two, also the economy we currently have is just not sustainable if other people are the ones who are bearing you know, the back of of this, and that's the, that's just the truth. We can be more fair, we can be more just, we can eradicate this, but if we are only thinking about profit, and I know most of the people are saying, you know, people over profits, you know, our land over profits, and it's really, really important that we come back and say, we cannot only be about, you know, being rich. 
I think the climate crisis has helped to underline that we have to think about more than just profits yes. in the way our economy is structured. But you would think modern slavery would be another one of those important lessons. So that's why I'm so glad you're here at the annual meeting. Yes, we've been talking a lot around what, you know, learning from the climate change movement and what they've managed to do in terms of articulating the message, in terms of really getting people to think about that. I think the past 20, 30 years has sort of put all of us as activists in different silos where we imagine that the issues that we are fighting for are different when in reality they, they are issues that are connected, right? They are all happening to the same, same people, most of the time to the same, same communities, right? So when you think about the issues that the climate change and the communities most impacted by climate change are the same, same communities that are impacted by modern slavery. So it, it makes perfect sense. It's logical that all these movements work together. I think fighting for humanity, going back to human dignity, a discussion around human dignity, a discussion around shared humanity, I feel is something we need to go back to. I feel like what we've done the past 20 years where everyone is specialized and everyone is thinking about this is my issue, this is my language, it's just making everyone confused and we are forgetting that people are the ones who are supposed to be at the center. I started out as a community activist. I was working in, I was working in my campaigning in my community and working in my community. I wasn't thinking about, you know, gender inequality as being different from hygiene issues or as being different from civic education. I was the same person that was working on all those things. What I wanted was just a better life for my community. And when you go into communities, when you go to impacted communities, that division is, as, a, as, as you said, is as a result of funding. It's not as a result of how these issues are occur in the community. So if we go back and ask ourselves why, and that's why the, for me right now, the conversation around, you know, sharing power, around, you know, trust-based philanthropy, I think it, they're great because if we start asking people, communities, what they need, then these issues are not separate the same woman that is trafficked is the same woman that is that went through gender-based violence. Is the same woman who whose children cannot go to school. It's probably the same woman that is going to migrate for work, and then you and then get trafficked and probably have to seek asylum and then be labeled a refugee. And, and what about the way forward? Like, I imagine that there are many companies here, and maybe you've been meeting with corporate CEOs who said would say, I don't want my products to have any slavery in the supply chain. What, what do you advise them to do? What do you want to see us do in terms of getting ahead of this issue? So one of the things that's key is really transparency when it comes to supply chains. And we're not saying uh, part of the problem is when you introduce the word risk to companies. And then you talk about being transparent about the risks that they have in their supply chain. It's not people are, are not are, are not as welcoming to that conversation. So there are different tools right now being developed with all the conversations around AI. There are different tools that are, be, are being developed to detect forced labor uh, in supply chains, and then have conversations with leaders with trade unions on how to actually do this. Companies need to go back, whether we like it or not, to decent work. Really defining what decent and dignified work is, is extremely important. And making sure that workers are at the center of coming up with these solutions. Because the last thing I also want is that when we talk about transparency, every company comes up with its own tool and there's no accountability. As someone who's a survivor, I think it's important to also think about the social aspect of this, that if you do detect that there's abuse, what are the remedial measures that you can take as a company to make sure that workers get justice and that communities get what they need. Looking for the inside story on what's happening at organisations like the World Bank, USAID or the Gates Foundation, then you need to be reading DevX Pro. I'm Jessica Abrahams and I'm the editor of DevX Pro. Pro is DevX's premium news subscription, where our expert reporters and analysts take you beyond the headlines, deep into the trends and institutions shaping the $200 billion aid industry. 
As well as all our news, you'll get access to conversations with global development leaders, resources to help you grow in your career, and a subscriber-only newsletter full of insider news and tidbits. See for yourself by getting a free trial today at devx.com slash pro. Earlier, I mentioned Peter Sands, the executive director of the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. The Global Fund is one of the most important and largest global health initiatives in the world, and it's made tremendous progress. But that progress is under threat. Even with a budget that stretches into the billions and billions of dollars each year, the Global Fund is finding new challenges, including through the climate crisis. Peter will explain in this conversation exactly what he and the Global Fund are doing to address it. I think we reported on DevX, you spoke to us a while ago that some 40% of the grant proposals you're getting now, the country plans, have a climate-connected component. Yeah. What is your perspective on this climate and health nexus that a lot of people are talking about at World Economic Forum this year? Well, there's a huge amount of uncertainty about it, right? There are lots of questions which we don't know the answer to. The question we do know the answer to is it's having an impact. Um, it's having an impact already. And uh, the most obvious example is malaria, uh, where uh, the patterns, the epidemiology of the disease are changing because the weather is becoming more unpredictable. Um, places that haven't seen malaria are now seeing it now um, because actually cold weather is a protection against mosquitoes and so as as places get warmer um, they become more attractive. Um, there's also complex interactions so for example I was recently in northern Nigeria with the health minister uh, Mohamed Pate and we saw a lot of uh, a shocking number of very severely ill small children they were all severely ill with malaria, but they were also malnourished, which makes them much more vulnerable to severe cases of malaria. And it's a good example of how the climate change interaction is, is sort of multifactorial. Climate change is upsetting agricultural productivity because the seasonality has become less predictable, leading to malnutrition. It's also changing the epidemiology of malaria. The combined impact on that is more severely uh, uh, ill children and more more death of, of small children and that's the kind of thing we're still trying to understand but my view is we need to act while we learn we can't sort of wait for a perfect answer we need to be um, doing more in anticipation of how we see this unfolding yeah and I think you know one of the big areas where climate is appearing as an issue is the MDBs uh, there's a lot of focus on the World Bank and others kind of changing from their normal traditional remit to adding climate. Ajay Banga famously has added, you know, on a livable planet to the mission of the World Bank. And there's a lot of attention and energy this year at the World Economic Forum annual meeting, I think, on how those MDB reforms might actually play out. Can they really crowd in the private sector? But a lot of the discussion I hear seems to be on renewable energy when it comes to what those banks can do, but much less so on health in particular. I know you signed an MOU with the, with the World Bank in particular. What do you see as, as the opportunity for the health community when we think of MDB reform? Well, we've done some things already in terms of uh, blended finance deals, uh, where we effectively buy down a portion of the loan or effectively pay the interest um, uh, on the loan so as to make it more cost-effective and more attractive for the countries. And the uh, loan would be used for health system strengthening? It can either be used for something like health system strengthening or if you've got a particularly particular vulnerability to a climate sensitive disease like malaria, it can be used as a, for a disease specific intervention. Um, I think much of it will be around health systems strengthening and that's a, you know, a buzz phrase, but there are specific aspects of health system strengthening um, that are very, very relevant to climate change. So, for example, uh, improved disease surveillance linkages with meteorological data. Um, so you're able to see how um, weather and climate are changing um, disease. Um, 
there's a lot of issues around resilience. We're seeing, <laughs> unfortunately, we're seeing in, in, in many places issues around flooding and cyclones destroying medical commodities. You saw this in Pakistan, you saw it with Cyclone Freddy um, in places like Mozambique and Mal Malawi. And it, it comes down to really basic things. The quality of storage of expensive medical commodities, you don't put them at floor level on the bottom shelf. Um, uh, and you ensure that you don't build a medical warehouse in a floodplain. Um, the, the, those sorts of things, but there's also temperature related things. Um, many medical commodities which are regarded as being fairly uh, temperature resilient, they don't do very well when it gets above 45 degrees or so, right? The, and, and so there's a, there's a need for, it's not sort of air conditioning in the conventional sense of having it, you know, 1920 degrees, it's air conditioning that stops it getting above 40. Right. Um, uh, and if you can do that through solar, you're not using fossil fuels to do it, but you're using it to protect valuable medical commodities. And we're going to have to think about that also in areas express, uh, experiencing extreme heat in terms of working conditions for healthcare uh, practitioners. Because if you're in a clinic and it's 45 degrees and you, you, you know, you're wearing protective clothing, the effective temperature for you is pretty unbearable. So the, these are sort of specific things that can be acted on. One of the big topics as well at this year's WEF is this is the year of elections. Some, you know, 60 percent of the world's population live in countries that will vote this year. European parliamentary elections are coming up. It, it looks like fringe parties may do better than ever. U.S. elections, unclear, but obviously it looks more clear today that Donald Trump may be the Republican nominee. And if he were to win the presidency again, I think we know the direction at least of ODA. We don't know the, the end result. So this, this has got to be a tough circumstance as you look ahead to replenishment in 2025 and you think about the picture, you know, the pie that you have to create to address these three key diseases to, to sustain the progress that's been made. How are you thinking about that? Or how are you, you know, you're talking to philanthropists and companies and government officials. How are you wrestling with that equation right now? Well, I'm now looking forward to, I'm not sure looking forward is quite the word, to my third uh, replenishment as executive director of the Global Fund. One thing I do know is that at this point in the cycle, so sort of halfway between the last replenishment and the next replenishment, it always looks really gloomy. Um, uh, and we've always thought, oh my God, you know, what's, what's going to happen next time around? That's not to say it isn't challenging. And as you point out, 2024 is going to be a massive year in terms of elections and uh, potential political um, shifts in both donor countries and implementer countries. I think we just have to keep making the argument is what kind of world do we want to live in? Do we, do we, do we want to live in a world where we have thousands of under fives or pregnant women dying each week of a disease, malaria, that we actually know how to get rid of and where for less than the budget of a major hospital in LA, um, we could get rid of. What kind of world do we want to live in? And while I absolutely appreciate the challenges of making that argument, when many people in the richer countries in the world aren't having a great time and are squeezed by inflation, I still think we should be pushing the argument. There has to be a sense of common humanity I also think there's a self-interest argument. When you look at parts of the world like uh, the Sahel, there are millions and millions of very young people there. Median age in a country like Chad is 17. They're being impacted by desertification because of climate change, by disease, by poverty, by conflict. Many of these people are not gonna stay where they are. They've all got mobile phones. They know how the world lives in other parts. And um, if people are worried about stability, about migration, about having a, a, a more prosperous world, there's, there is both, I think, uh, a fundamental moral argument, but also a kind of self-interest argument about the stability, the security of the world we live in.
Thanks for listening to Davos Dispatch, a special edition of This Week in Global Development. If you enjoyed today's episode, and I sure hope you did, please share it, or you can also leave us a rating or a review. Make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast streaming platform, and I'd love to hear what you think. Feel free to shoot me a message on social media at raj underscore devx, or send an email to podcasts at devx.com. Davos Dispatch is a podcast from DevX, and it's hosted by me, Raj Kumar. Today's episode was produced and edited by Naomi Mihara.